uh, a lot of the of uh, talk and writing uh, in recent months has been about artificial intelligence, fake people, fake humans. So this is the era of fakeness, right? We're in the era of fakeness, so fake news, of fake politicians, some argue fake president, but it's all, it's a time of fakeness. So now the ultimate and absolute of fakeness is a fake human. And scientists are working on forming and shaping a human robot. So as far as the intelligence is concerned, they call it AI, artificial intelligence, they already have the, the uh, capability of making a higher, better intelligence uh, in calculations better than uh, the average human being or even the above average human being if it concerns calculations. But they're still struggling with a lot of human, uh, human um, actions that computers can't figure out and robots cannot do. And the big question is what about feelings? So you have some scientists says we can program too. We can program that too. And others are saying we can't program that. So what's the difference between this scientist and that scientist? One has feelings and one doesn't have feelings. So you can program yourself and if you have no feelings you can program your being into a computer or a robot who'll speak and do stuff, etc. Here we're learning, Tanya, about human beings. And one of the attractions of Tanya is that it speaks to us, relates to us, and the illustrations that we have over here really show an understanding of our psyche. So we're in chapter 9, and we can re re recommend that people should get themselves a Tanya. They're in different languages. And uh, in chapter 9, he speaks about the battle of the noble and the savage that's in us. The godly soul and the animal soul. The part of us that wants to do what's right and the other part of us wants to do what feels good. So that's what this is about. And... We spoke about this last week, and this is a common theme. So the, one of these souls, or one of these personalities that is in us, wants to have a, a, the person run their way, noble, kind, idealistic. And that other soul wants the person to be a person that is self-centered, materialistic, looking for their own self. And it's like a city where there are two kings fighting over a city. One wants to take complete control over the city and the other one wants to. And that is really the, the battle that is going on in us every day the inner struggle of our nobility and our selfishness, our idealism and our, uh, uh, our own self-centeredness. And in this discussion, he speaks about um, the godly soul. That part of us that is looking for the ideal, for the noble, for the prince in us. And first he said how it wants us, our mind, our intelligence, to understand things in a noble way, to use the facility of intelligence. And here what we're up to now is about feelings. It's about feelings. And how are our feelings? Now feelings could be fear, feelings could be love. And they're probably parallel 
love and fear. Fear can take complete control of the person, take possession of the person, move the person, and love can take complete possession of the person, move the person, both of them could motivate equally. He's going to be spending time speaking about love, love for Hashem, but to understand the love that we're supposed to have for Hashem, we have to also understand love in general, because it is a human experience. He spends more time on love than on fear. We also have an understanding of quote unquote fear of God or the sense of awe towards God. But I think he spends more about love because love is more part of the essence of a person. Fear could move him completely, motivate him greatly, but fear is coming from the outside. Something outside of him is threatening him or intimidating him, maybe moving him in another direction. But it's from outside to inside. And he can become thoroughly um, uh, um, possessed by it. It is an emotion. It is a feeling. And feelings are about the inside of a person. But it's coming outside to the inside. Love is coming from the inside and moving the person towards the outside. The person has an object of their love. It could be a person, or it could be a thing, or it could be a, a, ha a, it could be a habit that is motivating them, and it's coming from the inside towards the outside. So therefore, love is part and parcel of the inner part of a person, the inner makeup of a person, more than fear. Now, I'm, it, 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 so the text reads, that the godly soul wants the person to be moved with a fiery love. There's a fiery love that the person should have where he thirsts for Hashem. He goes out, his, his thirst is so much that he wants, he wants his soul to become one with Hashem. He is restless, He's not, he can't be in his place. Thir that's why it's called the thirst. With all his heart and his soul and his might. From the depth of his heart, that's on the right side, the right side of his heart, where we spoke about where the godly soul is from. A person, can, we can define a person by his loves, by his passions. You ask a person what they're passionate about, you ask a, per, you ask a person what they love, and you can tell much about a person. What are your passions? Some people's making money. Some people it's pleasure. Some people it's sports. The Romans in the Colosseum, it was gladiators killing each other. Or humans fighting lions. So you had tens of thousands of people filling the Roman Colosseum, cheering and shouting the top of their lungs. And what was moving them? Blood. And it's been argued by psychiatrists that some of that may be in the passion for sports. Passion, you have a passion for intelligent ideas, passion for kindness, volunteering, visiting the sick, helping people, advising people. What's your passion? What's your love? The people you love, why do you love them? Do you love people or do you love yourself? 
Someone who says, I love fish. Does he love fish? If he loved fish, he wouldn't eat fish. <laughs> to eat fish, you first have to kill the fish. So when he says, I love fish, he doesn't really love fish. He loves himself. Unfortunately, often it happens that people say they love someone and really they love themselves. So they see themselves like a person loves fish. Why does he love fish? Because fish, he likes fish, it eats, it tastes good, it makes him feel good. So that is the object of their love, they love themselves. So if you want to define a person, what kind of love he has? The Torah, one of the Ten Commandments is Lois Sachmoid. Do not covet, do not desire or be jealous of in someone else's house, someone else's wife, someone else's donkey, car today. So I want stuff. I love that. I love this. I love that. Is it yours? Is it someone else's? Is it a kosher love? Is it not a kosher love? So where is our love? So he describes this love as fire. And later on we're going to get to a love that's called the love like water. The early, first love that he speaks about here is Avas Hashem Ki Eish Boyara. It's a love like fire. Now, fire is dry and thirsty. Fire spreads, it doesn't stay in one place, it moves. The fire wants to. Uh, the Hasidic Kabbalah speaks about how the fire really wants to tear itself away from the wick. It's just held there by the wick, but it's always going upwards. It wants to go upwards. And if it doesn't have anything to hold on to, it will leave. So it's a love that moves us to become one with the object of love, to get and acquire, to become closer. So there's a love that is because of distance. I want something that's distant for me and I want to get it, so it's moving me together to get it. So it's in the beginning of the love that the person is, 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 cannot stay still and he's moved and it's, th it's, it's, it's thirsty, it wants to be quenched and it's doing anything it can to, to come closer to the object of their love. There's passion in there. Passion connected with fire. You know, a real good fire makes noise. If you ever see a log burn, you ever buy a campfire, it makes noise. It's loud. In the Torah, they describe the angels that are on fire. Barash Godel is a big noise from this fire. So that is, there's a sense of distance where it wants to come closer. Water makes things stick together. You put water and you can make you flour. Flour is powder. And you mix water with it, it'll stick together. You make dough, it becomes dough. So water is the moistness that things stick together. Water is connected with pleasure. We're going to speak later about the love of water, which that's a love which comes through closeness. It's closeness when one is already connected with the object of their love and they're calm. They're, they're already connected, they're in a very pleasant state because they are one with the object of their love.
So therefore, the Rebbe told him that he should study Torah with a koch, when a koch is with a fire. So then his koch, his fire, will not be in unhealthy habits. Now everyone could relate to this in their own way. We have different sides to us. We call it the godly soul, the animal soul. Our different sides, our baser instincts, our selfishness. And Tanya tells us you also have a godly side. You have a noble, you have a prince in you. So turn the beast into a prince. But before you can turn the, the beast into a prince, you have to bring out the prince to be so strong that for a while you may have still have a beast in you, but compartmentalize him, put him in his place, and be busy with your prince. They once asked the Alta Rebbe, they asked the Alta Rebbe, what's the difference between the teachings of Hasidus and the teachings of Musar? Now these were two, two uh, teachings of ethics that are still around today. There's the Hasidic approach and there's the Musar approach. One emphasized doing good and the positive, and one warned about the negative and how you should really, the, uh, the Musar approach is to focus on your problems and your negativity and that's the way to uproot it. The Hasidic approach was focus on the positive and automatically the negative will fall away. So they asked the Alter Rebbe, what do you say about that? So the Alter Rebbe said, it's like how to handle a thief. There are two ways to handle a thief. One way is someone sees the thief wandering around town so he shouts, the thief is here, the thief is here. Everybody, watch out, the thief is here. So now one closes their doors, locks their windows, brings in all their equipment, all their stuff, because they had a warning, the thief is here. And what happens as well? The thief runs away. Because they, he was exposed. Hey, I found the thief. So the thief is, is, is everyone's you know, circling the wagons and the thief runs away. The other approach is capture the thief. Don't let him run away and don't just protect yourself. Capture the thief. And when you capture the thief, hope, hopefully you can rehabilitate him, re reform him, recreate him. So, what's the difference between these two approaches? One approach is you're never going to solve the problem with the thief. You warned against the thief, so he's running away, but he's going to come back another day. The other approach is really, you're, you're trying to turn around the thief that there should be no longer a thief. So this is, this is what's called a Hasidus, the, the, the first approach is, the most approach is to warn, to be wary of him. So we have evil, so be careful of that. So we, we analyze yourself, is this something selfish? Is this something noble? What kind of feeling is this? Be aware of, of your selfishness. So you're in the company of a friend or a family, and jealous thoughts come into your head. Be wary, oh, this is jealousy. It's not a good quality. Or anger, be wary about your anger. Or depression, oh, I'm depressed now because of this, because of that. Oh, depressed, not a good thing. So you're warning against depression. You're warning against jealousy. You're warning against lust. You're warning yourself about that. So it's not gonna let take, take, take you over. The Hasidic approach is really to turn him around. To turn around that 
that feelings into something positive, which we, the turnaround we're going to speak about soon. But at this point, let's at least subdue it, control it. You know, they advise, counsels advise a widow. They advise her that she should get involved in volunteering. So she has a hole in her heart and she is really gloomy in her heart, in her life, and every day is cloudy and dark. And it's, depression is painful and she may have a good reason to be de depressed. So the counselor's advisor, the best thing for you to do is go to shul, go visit the sick in the hospital, get involved in something positive. And while you're being involved in something positive, that's going to shine a light into your life. So a person is attracted to, to negative things. His love is base and gross. His attractions are to things that are not healthy. So the first thing is get a life and a passion into what's good and holy. And if you're going to become passionate about what's good and holy, automatically the destructive passions will be subdued. That's step number one. So therefore, become a pa that fire, the love of fire. The love of fire, become passionate of something. You be, allow yourself to be possessed by what's good and holy. Yiddishkeit is a, a tool and an instrument that Hashem gave us. The Torah is a gift. The mitzvah is a gift that Hashem gave us to enable us to have a purpose in life, a meaning in life, and to be passionate about what's good and what's noble in life. And to become a prince. And like he says, we learned in the second chapter in Tanya, that every one of us has a part of Hashem. And just like a father and mother give their genes, drops of a father and a mother, cells of father and mother form and become a child, Similarly, there's sparks of God that are the cells that form Anishama, our soul. So we have a, a prince in us. What's a prince? A prince is the son, son of a king. We are a prince, we are princesses. And we also recognize our faults and our basis, our mishigas and our greediness and our habits and our addictions and being possessed with that other side of us, the animalistic side, our baser, baser instincts. So you have to know is, get passionate about what's good. It's a beautiful world out there. Get passionate with Yiddishkeit. That's the strongest and healthiest fire. And everybody on their level. And when you become possessed by what's good and what's holy, and that's in this war, the war is an inner battle and inner struggle but, but uh, uh, allow yourself and get involved in what's good and what's holy to daven, and then you'll ch that will be the turnaround. So the first step is what's called iskafia, to bend and subdue. And the ultimate goal is what's called ishapcha, the total reformation, the whole recreation of, of that quality. And he explains, that after you have within yourself a healthy love, a positive love, a passionate love for Hashem, and all of your and, and and in this way will be subdued your unhealthy passions and your unhealthy attractions, eventually you'll be able to turn around yourself to, to have a totally healthy love that even your animalistic side, even your body, will become sublimated, that even your physicality will have a sense to what's noble. It won't just be an ideal coming from your godly soul, but even your animal soul will turn around. Hashem <laughs> 
The Torah says, Love Hashem with all Lavavcha with both of your hearts. With your godly soul and also with your animal soul. We could sublimate ourselves and refine ourselves to the degree that we will physically feel satisfaction in doing what is noble and ha have a happiness also physically by doing what is right and what is spiritual, what is Torah, and what's mitzvahs, we can make that turn around because that's how Hashem programmed even the animal soul of a, of a, of a person. The higher level is not the level of love like fire, it's the love that's like water. And in the the in the in the in the Shira Shirim, this is called Ava Batanugim. The love the, the, ple the pleasurable love, the love where there's already pleasure, where there's already closeness with the beloved. And when it's closeness, it's now calm. And why does that show? That shows that the person is completely connected with the object of their love. That's why there now is calmness. So when a person reaches that love, and, and what he's speaking about ultimately is the love with Hashem, it's going to take complete control also of his, of, his, of, his, of, his, of his body and his physical side, that his physical side is also, also satisfied with the inner meaning of life. So how does this transformation take place? That is the water of love. That's more transformative. That is when you're when you sublimated yourself, nobilize yourself, when you turned the beast into a prince. Now this is a very high level. That's really a level for tzaddikim, for, for, so to say, very righteous people. But I think the practical lesson over here is how this, how we can apply this even in a, if we're not on that level of being a godly person. And we still have our physicality and our physical pleasures and so on. But if we take the the paradigm, the model that he speaks about over here of the steps of love, love of fire that's from a distance and bring us closer to a, a, a love of water that's close for things that are higher and noble and trans we, can, and can, we can transform ourselves. And one illustration of this could be the Jewish Torah recipe for married life. In married life, there are the laws of mikvah called Taras HaMishpacha. The laws of mikvah, Taras HaMishpacha, are such that when a woman has her period, the husband and wife don't have relations. So during the, their, certainly the, the early years of marriage, in their youth, so you have like two weeks, yes, two weeks, no, more or less. So there's something interesting that psychologists have noticed that happens. And we're not going in, this is not a class about marriage, and about the laws of Tara Samishpacha. That's not the point over here. But there's something that is brought out through this. Hashem created a man and a woman, made them holy through marriage. They have a chuppah, blessings. 
And, and this entails passion, like we mentioned before. And not only spiritual passion, physical passion. And that's a, hel a healthy marriage, where there's physical passion between husband and wife. That's a healthy marriage. And that's how Shem created us and programmed us. But then Torah says, well, that's part of the month. The other part of the month, no physical relations whatsoever. So then what? It's a husband and wife. They're physical. There's their hormones. What's going on? So what's going on is, Torah is saying, you know, these are people, a husband and wife, it's not just male and, male and female of the species that are put together in a room. This is a human being. It's not an object for pleasure. Let's talk. No touch, just talk. The relationship is now focused completely on personality, on person. Who are you? What do you feel? What do you think? How can I express love without physicality? Is that at all possible? So in a culture which is so materialistic, the so-called celebrity culture with the focus is on body and physical beauty, Torah says, you know, that's great. And Hashem created a world where there's physical beauty and physical pleasure and male and female, which is similar to animals and there's passion. Great. But there's also inner beauty. And the, 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 the time of the month when they, they don't have physical relationship here is the time when they can focus completely on the inner beauty that is in their relationship. So this is another form, and one can apply this in their life. What, feelings, how to make feelings more refined. Beauty, there's the inner beauty, there's the outer beauty. Love, there's an inner love and an outer love. Motivation, drive, ideals. Everything can turn around and, and structured in a healthy way, in a positive way. And that's what he says over here, that take desire. So our physical desire is structured in a certain way. Is desire good or bad? Is lust good or bad? So the way he says over here, the lust in itself is a drive. Desire is a drive. It depends on what it is dressed up in. It depends what's the structure over which you build this drive. You can plug in to the wall a heater and it's gonna make the room hot. You can plug in an air conditioner, it's gonna make the roof cold. You plugged in your lust for what? Lust for life? Lust for anything goes? Lust for what's kosher, for what's not kosher. We can reshape and redefine what the energy, electric energy, comes from the wall. It's just a plug. It connects us to electric energy. But what are you plugging in? What are you structuring? What is, what is the instrument through that you are putting and attaching this drive, this lust, to. So, uh, uh, desire, he says, we have a base, base desire. We find this, so we have a base desire 
for what is gross. We have a base lust for what is gross, for what may be even destructive. The lust itself in its purest form is just a drive for something, an attraction for something that is pleasurable. If you could structure your pleasures in a more refined way, structure your marriage in a more beautiful way, in a kosher way, in a healthier way, then it's good and it's holy. But if you let, allow your rough lust to go, it just takes me where I am. That's an animal. An animal just runs where he wants to run. That's why you have to put a saddle on a horse or a yoke on a bull to control him. Otherwise, he's going to be all over the place. And we find in our, in our literature, put a yoke on your animal. Put the yoke of Hashem on you. And in one place it says that tefillin is to tire up your animal soul. You have to put on tefillin. Women, husbands who wear tefillin are better husbands. Brothers who wear tefillin are better brothers. Because it ties, up, ties them up to what's good. And men have a lot of loose ends. They've got to be tied up a little. That's what tefillin is. But it's not just tying up. Ultimately, it's to make the, the transformation. Shemem bo taivus tanuga elam hazem etchilak meshikasa beitz chaim shanun peregil b'shem azayar shara nepachli is taiv gomer. Evil can be totally turned around to be good. Kmi yitzet taiv mamish. You could turn around your baseness and your drive for what's gross and base and animalistic. You can turn that around to be a drive and a passion for what's good and what's noble, a marriage that's good and noble, a, a, a son, a daughter that's good and noble, a drive that's good and noble to do more good and kindness in this world. We're so materialistic, we're so body-centered, we're so animalistic in our lives, we're not even aware of it. We're not even conscious about how we are so self-centered. We're not even conscious of it. But if we would become more conscious of our godly side and work on ourselves, we'll be able to reform ourselves. And as I said before, each person on their level, they can apply this in a practical way. And he considers, And he's going to continue about this, and I think at this time we're going to say good evening. Thank you all for coming.